Um, just uh, one other thing, um, if, you're, if you're new to this uh, and you're not on my current email list and you'd like to join, just put it, your email in the chat and uh, no one will report that, um, for you as well too. So we do ask that you keep your uh, audio on mute during the talk and uh, you can have an opportunity to ask questions afterwards. Next week, Brenda unfortunately is not going to be here, so next week we're going to do a show and tell. What that means is uh, we are asking you guys to find artic artifacts or stories that you have from your house. So you'll need a, obviously you'll need audio and obviously you'll need video on your computer to be able to participate in that. So think about that and hopefully you'll join us. And even if you have uh, something in your house, if you want to show everyone and you have a, a laptop that you can move around, that's by all means, you can, you can do that as well too. So uh, just keep it interesting and uh, let's have some fun with it. So without further ado, we got our cake and we got our coffee. I hope you guys do too. We're going to turn it over to Glenda and Karen and uh, bear with us. This is the first time we're doing this, so uh, might be some technical glitches or some fumbles or whatever, but we're just going to have some fun with this and, and see how it goes. All right? Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Byers, for those of you who don't know me, and I have Glenda Cornforth with me this morning. And Glenda worked for many years in the archives, and I'm now working as an archives clerk in the basement. Artifacts weren't our primary <laughs> domain. We're kind of winging it here. But what I've done is I've pulled about a dozen artifacts from the collection. We're going to play Stump with Glenda, which I'm sure <laughs> won't be happening. But And some of them kind of scarily I recognize and have used in my homes. Hopefully we'll have a little fun with this. And then we have perhaps one or two at the end that we really don't know the history of and maybe uh, you can help us out with that. So maybe I'll start with something easy, Glenda, from the start. So here's our first artifact, Linda. Can you tell us anything about this? Well, I think to pull out the eggs, when you were boiling eggs, you would lift them out. Now, I just heard this morning that uh, Karen had another solution for this. So Karen, can you tell me what you have to say about this object? Well, I remember my mom using it as a pea strainer in our house. So obviously it's been around for a long time and she probably inherited it from her mom and used it for what was convenient for her. So, so there you go. All right. Strain the peas or take out the hard boiled eggs. All right. What else have we got, Karen? So this artifact is another one from my childhood. Glenda, what do you remember about this particular artifact? I, oh. I believe this was donated by Dennis McKinsey. Oh, this is a cookie cutter, I guess. Probably for very small cookies, maybe shortbread, maybe the sugar cookies at Christmas. But I also remember, as many of you will, the ones that were a spade, a diamond, a club, and a heart. And they were used for the bridge club so that they could make dainty sandwiches for the bridge club. So you rotated it to whatever shape you wish. So, and very, very good that it spins so well. So that's a cookie cutter. This one looks really interesting. We'll have to make cookies, Karen, and try this. Oh, I remember this one being used only at Christmas time for my mother's shortbread. It only came out at Christmas time, but then my mother didn't bake very much either. So, uh, Glenda, I believe that this artifact comes from your home. This brings lots of memories. I first remember this in Saskatchewan when I lived there with my parents. When my mother, it was canning time. My mother would bring this out because this went around the sealer and to pull it out of the hot water. I have inherited it and I've used it many, many times and very much appreciated it because when you reach down to grab a sealer in that hot boiling canning kettle, you need something to pull it out. I might be copper, but it has a wooden handle and it worked really well. So, Very, yeah, Karen? Um, in the collection, we have this one labeled as a, a jar lifter as well. And Glenda and I were a bit stumped on how exactly this one worked and um, the weight of this one compared to that night light one. So it's a totally different model of jar lifter. And if anybody has any other suggestions, we'd appreciate it because it boggles me how you would, we need to get a sealer to try it, but it boggles me. So if anybody has any other ideas for this, they could let us know. It looks pretty heavy to me. And then you're lifting out a quart sealer 
That's quite a bit of weight. Yeah. Well, perhaps um, Rob will let us use his newly renovated kitchen next month and we can practice lifting jars out of hot water. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Uh, something similar to this um, got a lot of action on Facebook. I think care of Alan Porter the other day. So, oh, right. The, the uh, trusty sifter for flour. And this one probably could have been given by the meat market. Oh, it's, it was given by the Jasper Park Bakery. W.M. Whiteman. That's Bill Whiteman. And his daughter, Linda, and I went to school together. And it says, when you sift it down, you'll find it pays to trade at Jasper Park Bakery. And it's two cups. No surprise to you people who bake. There's good measurement here. Two cups, one cup. And, and isn't it elegant? Look at the nice paint job. And, and Whiteman's gave that away probably at Christmas time instead of a calendar. So very handy. useful. Very useful. All right. So we have one from the collection and one from Glenda's house. And can you tell us about these items? Well, nothing I ever used, but I heard my mother say that uh, they were used to do up buttons. So they're button hooks. And this one is very simple and it probably did up bigger buttons. And then my mother gave me this one and it was, it's much smaller, and it was for doing up the buttons on your gloves, on your dress gloves. You would just put the loop over like this. This one was probably for the small buttons on a blouse or a jacket. So those were button hooks. Uh, this one has a kind of a tortoise shell handle, but this one is just very functional. So those were the two button hooks. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mentioned to Glenda when we started that this one is associated with the smell of burning hair in my memory, <laughs> because I remember my grandmother fighting with me so that I would have curly hair. Tell us about this. Well, I can tell you, my mother had one of these, and this is a curling iron, and you, to heat it up, you put it in the cool oil lamp chimney, and you waited till it got really hot. And then you took it to your hair and you curled your hair. My mother's was burnt the handle off. So they had put on an insulating uh, coupling on it just so that they could grab a hold of it because the handles get really hot after you can imagine. They're stuck in the coil oil lamp and they heat up, heat up. And on your hair, so that it would stay, mom said they mixed a little sugar and water and put it on your hair. And then you heated up the curling iron and you just took your hair and you crimped it all up for going to the Saturday night dance. Woohoo! And my uh, experience with it involved uh, rags. My grandmother would tie rags in my hair. Do you remember anything like that just to hold the curls? Yeah. You, what you did was, I think I did on my daughter once. <laughs> she, another Karen. Yeah, another Karen. <laughs> You you ripped a bed sheet and the, uh, the strips were about an inch wide and then you just roll up the hair. I'm looking at one of the staff who has long hair and I'm just dying to do this. <laughs> you roll it up and you tie it in a knot and you let it dry. And then you just undo that and you've got these lovely flowing curls. It didn't last long. <laughs> and and you could, the kids could go to bed with it because yes. it didn't really... No, it wasn't yeah. like a curler, yeah. which we'll find a curler. Oh, yeah. That's another, another element of torture. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, people might have guesses on what this item is. How does that one work, Linda? Well, I think some, I still have one, but not as sturdy as this one. Wow. This one is commercial. You boil the egg, hard boiled egg, ran it under cold water. And you took all of the shell off and you placed it in here and you put it down it went because it has these very sturdy. And of course, you, you had violin, violin type. You didn't want to put an onion in there. You might break it. Then you turned it the other way. 
and put it down. And that's the the deviled eggs, or they were deviled eggs because they were hard, boiled. That went in the potato salad or the egg salad sandwich that had to be made for every funeral reception. You have to have egg salad salad sandwiches. So this is, I still have one, but this is really, this is it's high commercial, high quality. This is a sturdy one. It's probably been in the dishwasher and got a bit changed. Not, not here, not at the museum. No, we, try not we to don't do that. touch anything like that. Well, this is uh, a more modern artifact. And um, on the label, it says handcrafted in Jasper by Arvin Hilworth. And um, yeah, this brings back lots of memories of Arvin for me. And I first saw one of these at my neighbor's, at Lorna Jensen. And Lorna always came home from the grocery store with two plastic bags laden with groceries. And you know how they cut through your fingers? Well, Karen, she found one of these somewhere. And you know Arvin, he only needed to see it twice, and he had one made. So the handles of the shopping bags went there. And you carried it home like this. It worked really well. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. 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 Another ingenious argument. Yeah. It's very and I uh, guarantee that this was made out of recycled wood from a sign or stair posts or something because Arvin never wasted anything. Okay. Now, this one I never had in our house. What can you tell me about this item? Well, I always wanted one and I still do. And I, when I watch these oh, lovely parting gifts, yeah, that's wonder. right. When I, when I watch TV and these snazzy chefs, they wax poetic about this. And they put you put the potatoes in here, and you push this down, and you squeeze it, and you get what's called riced potatoes. And they look elegant on the plate, and a little bit of gravy, and it looks very, very nice. But they were very trendy and. I can remember an aunt of mine, when she was cooking for the thrashing gangs on the prairie, she would make rice potatoes in a big bowl. And it looked really good, but they're still used, like I said, when you see them on TV. So a potato ricer, okay. I think it's called. All right. Yep. So perhaps not found uh, under your kitchen counter, but what would uh, someone use this item for? Well, I think I remember Mr. Neighbor uh, had an ice house and it was down on what is Benham Street, probably near the Fireman's Park. And they stored ice that they cut in the uh, winter months in there. And then they would bring them to our ice boxes in our home. Since we didn't have any fridges, we had a box that had a door at the top or maybe a door that you lifted up and a door at the bottom. And you put your sign in the window that you wanted ice. The man came in and they opened it and they closed it around the big block of ice and they came up the steps and they dripped water all over the steps, through the kitchen, down into the basements, down the stairs, drip, drip, drip. And they opened it up and put it in the top part of that ice box. And then they went out again and you had to pay for that block of ice. And as the ice melted, it ran down the back of the cabinet into a tray at the bottom. And you had to dump that tray frequently. And of course, you know, it spilled all over. Hopefully it was in the basement, but some people had their ice boxes in maybe the back porch. So there wasn't that concern about the wet feet and the dirty floor, et cetera. But these were used by the ice people. And Mr. Neighbor, as I said, had a, a nice house over on uh, Benham Street. And, and they had, this is what the men used when they brought it. I think um, some children had memories of getting a sliver of ice as, as a treat just to suck on. And, and on a hot day, how nice that yes, was. Yes, that's right. When the, when the truck came by. Yeah. And uh, you could look for it. And I can't remember what the sign said, that when you wanted ice, you put it in the window. Because uh, nobody had a phone. So that's how you had to indicate that you wanted ice that day. 
kind of like the uh, dry cleaning. And, yes, and that's true. more modern history. They'd have an after fabric care to come here, pick up your dry cleaning. Yeah, yeah, I remember. All right. Let's see. Well, we're getting down to the bottom. Might be more interesting. Again, probably associated with the strong smell of wool. <laughs> Well, I think most of you can see what they probably are, but they were very, very important on wash days because the socks were usually hand knit, so they were wool. And when you washed them, you didn't want them to shrink. So you put them on the sock stretchers. So you pull them on, pull them on, pull them up. And then you could hang them on the line, but if it was a really windy day, perhaps they were hung in the the basement on the line or maybe the bathroom where it was warmer. Then in during the war, the women knit socks for the soldiers and they were very much wool. So I don't know how they managed because they wouldn't have had sock stretchers. They probably didn't wash their socks. No, that, that's right. <laughs> now that another thing which we don't have were pant stretchers. So wash day pants were pants made of cotton that you could wash a little lighter than blue jeans, but they wanted to have them dry and they sometimes wanted them ironed, but it sure helped when you could stretch them on the stretchers. That meant you didn't have to iron them to get that crease because you know the guys like the crease in the front. So you put your, pull the cotton pants on and my mother would say, call those wash pants because the winter pants were usually uh, Melton wool and they weren't washable so when she would say well you're going to wear your wash pants today you knew it was getting summer and warmer weather because they were cotton pants. <laughs> <laughs> All right well this one might be a bit of a challenge. Yes uh, I think we see these in the north sometimes uh, as, a, as a knife but I think I think this was used for chopping nuts. You know, for your baking, you would chop the walnuts or usually walnuts is what we could see at the store. But I think this is for chopping. And maybe if it was really, really sharp, you could maybe mince a few onions, but it was a chopper. And it's interesting, it's got a little uh, uh, loop at the top, so it must have hung up somewhere in the pantry. What did Captain Burr? No, because it's sharp. You know, it would cut you. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It would be dangerous. Huh. It would be wise to hang it up. All right. Yeah. Well, I think we've come to the last item, Glenda, and I believe that you brought this from home. And um, I have no idea what it is. Uh, well, this was our mystery object today. And although we don't have much of an audience, I'm going to ask them what they think it might be. Yeah. yeah, really close. Okay. Get it really Here. close. Yeah. yeah, get it really close. I, I know there's somebody that if they're watching, they will know what it is. So it seems to have two um, irregularly shaped holes up the top. Uh, if you're a sewer, there's your first hint. Ah, Janice is nodding her head. Okay. <laughs> oh, I Yes? Was there someone that had an idea? Is it, is it for threading a bigger needle? No, all, but you're close. We, we can't see very well, but. Yeah, you might not bring it to this one. Yeah, she's going to take it to the other. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it it was uh, something that um, well you could even use it today, and and since we're all wearing masks, uh, when you make a mask, uh, you have to have elastic on the sides. Okay. So this is called an elastic threader. 
So you would put the elastic in and then you'd be able to thread it through the casing, whether it was uh, a pair of uh, uh, pants for the youngsters or for making a mask like this. Or a the, drawstring. A drawstring, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. And, pardon me? Uh, no, no. Smocking, yeah, is... Yeah, a little bit different, but it, it, this one is really fine. Like it, sometimes they were bigger, but this one was really if you had very fine elastic and you were threading it through a dress that in the waist or something that you wanted it very elegant or two casings through, but it's a, a, an elastic threader. So that was our mystery one today. Thank you, Karen. You're very welcome. So one last item that I brought out, and I wasn't sure if it was a household item or what it was, and I thought Glenda would know, and uh, neither of us know too much about this item. It's called a Goffrey iron, G-O-F-F-R-E-Y, I believe. And if anyone knows that, I'm sure it's in the database, but I just assume Glenda knew all these items. <laughs> so I didn't print, no, print off. No, the only thing I can think of it that its name is that to me, a soldering iron would fit because this is a hollow that a soldering iron would fit here. So when you were working, you'd be able to rest your soldering iron in there, but we don't have the soldering iron. So it's up for suggestion. Right. Stay tuned for next week and you can tell us what you think it is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Free tote bag will be awarded to the person who gets the correct answer wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got the thumbs up. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, thank you very much, Glenda. It's been a pleasure working with you and learned a lot this morning, and I hope our audience has too. Well, good luck next week. I'd be anxious to hear how you made out with show and tell. And we'll be anxious to hear how things go at Chateau. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Feel free to just pipe in, turn off your audio, and pipe in if you like. So you guys are talking about putting it in the fire, and then you also talked about wetting your hair. Why would you just put it in boiling hot water and then just go straight to the hair? And my grandmother did it on the burner of dough. This thing's kind of cool because then you can make all yeah. kinds of yeah. cookies, right? Yeah, and I bet you you could do like this. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was kind of Yeah, that, 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 that's me. Yeah. Anyways, if nobody has any questions, thank you all for joining us today. Don't forget, next week is show and tell. Even if you don't have anything to show or tell, please tune in, 1030. Again, I hope you guys enjoyed today. Bye, oh, all around. So, uh, One right? more question. Oh, what do you want? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no no I'm just thinking, given that a lot of the utensils and implements you showed today are not available anymore, you couldn't get them for love or money, has the Museum and Archives ever considered a little bit of a side hustle doing heritage catering and housekeeping? <laughs> Uh, excuse me, Warren, but we'll um, we'll enlist you to do carry the blocks of ice when we do that. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. So think about show and tell next week, and maybe even practice in front of your computer on on how to show it. And that's the biggest challenge always, right? So let people see it and even if you just have a story about genealogy or something like that that's fine too so we'll sign off and uh we'll see you guys all next week thank you for joining us thank you <laughs>